The topics we're going to cover with the panel tonight are both boards of advisors and boards of directors um, and differentiation, be, differentiating between the two and addressing the question, question, Tanya, as to when do you get one and when do you get the other, how are the roles different, how are the functions different, what do you look for in the boards of advisors and boards of directors, how do you compensate. Um, so we'll get into the meat of it in a minute. Um, do you guys each want to introduce yourselves, a couple of you are GSB alums, a couple of you aren't? Um, and talk about your role. Some of you are entrepreneurs who have boards of advisors and directors, and some of you serve on these boards. But quick introductions. I'm Nazila Alasti. I am the CEO and founder of <coughs> Juners.com. Uh, it's a, a product, a software product that's delivered through a web browser, and its, uh, its aim is to help organizers of informal groups do a better job of coordinating their volunteers. That's what we do. I'm a GSB alum, uh, class of 88. I'm Evelyn Dilsaver. I am a graduate of the 96 Stanford Executive Program. I retired two years ago from Schwab, where I headed up uh, Charles Schwab Investment Management, which is the mutual fund arm of Schwab. And I serve on boards. I'm on three public company boards and three non-for-profit boards. <laughs> and I also served on two um, advisory boards for startup companies. My name is Liz Fetter, and I'm actually a graduate of the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon, educated back east. And I am, I've been a three-time CEO of both public and private companies. One was a startup. And um, currently, I am on three public company boards, two advisory boards of startups, and I'm the chair of the Board of Trustees of a University in San Francisco. Uh, my name is Alyssa Rapp. I am a class of 2005 out of the GSB, not so long ago. I founded Bottlenotes.com, an online wine company, immediately thereafter, uh, and have thus had my own board of advisors and board of directors for four years. Uh, in that time, I've also uh, joined the board of trustees for Hubbard Street Dance Chicago, one of the country's preeminent modern dance companies. So I've gotten to see a little bit of how the other side works. Uh, but uh, it's been, can speak to when to start that board and how invaluable they can be. In the form of a little bit of a quiz. Um, can you talk to the difference between a board of advisors and a board of directors in terms of the role, when entrepreneurs should pull them together, kind of the, the difference between the two? Anybody? Sure. I can, I can mm -hmm. start. Um, as a founder um, in technology, uh, for me, the board of advisors has been more important than the board of directors. Um, my board of directors still is myself and my husband, just because I can find him and get signatures whenever I want to. It's pretty <laughs> informal. Um, and we haven't done a major round of financing. We've been angel funded to date, so we haven't really needed the structure that the previous panel was talking about. But my board of advisors really has been um, instrumental, super important in getting many things off the ground in changing direction and helping me decide on, on very um, important uh, topics. So for me, that has been the experience. And I would say that a quick answer, I, I look at board of directors as my boss. I look at board of advisors as my friends and supporters. That's kind of how I think about them in my mind. Mm -hmm. I mean, Liz, you did a particularly good job, I think, of compiling a board of advisors. Can Thank you. Uh, I, you know, was, not a technologist, 26 years old, at the GSB, starting a company, never had, had been in politics before business, so I felt it pretty darn important to surround myself by really, really, really smart, really, really, really well experienced folks. So from the beginning, we, we too are angel backed, it raised about $3 million to date, but for the first, from the very beginning, day one, even we were at seed capital stage of less than a million, I formed a board of directors with outside directors. and. Um, I think in some ways for signaling purposes, since I pulled in Jack Cakebread, one of the fathers of Napa Valley, and Jim Cook, one of the founding team members at Netflix, given that our original strategy was sort of to be the Netflix of wine, I think it really lended extraordinary credibility to the, to the venture. Um, and I actually, uh, like Nazila, you think, of it, think of board members as friends. I don't demarcate between directors and advisors in that way because my earliest folks were outside directors, so there was a very healthy um, they weren't early. They weren't investors in the company. They too were there just to cheer, uh, and coach and guide. They had a different fiduciary responsibility, but they. I have a very close relationship with with both. Um, when we got to the next round of financing, and you know, an individual wrote a million dollar check and wanted a board seat for it. That's when um, I have had my first director on the board for whom 
I do technically work. And that has changed the dynamic, and it's I feel very fortunate that I was lucky enough to start with outside directors and then pull in someone who was an investor, because if I had just gone into a VC scenario or, uh, you know, where everyone was a paying customer, I think it could have been very intimidating. I'd never chaired a corporate board before. I had no idea that it took a week to prepare board books. I had no idea that um, people people didn't want to be there just to have a rubber stamp, at, at least at particularly early stage. The, um, the other women can talk about this much with much more experience than I, but people are smart and busy and care, and they want to be there spending their time helping you think through something critical. Um, and so that's how I've leveraged my board of directors. Like Nazila, I've built a pretty large advisory board, and it does have some of, uh, you know, of, a, of a couple dozen people since the beginning. They're not all, people have different life cycles and different, you have different needs for different types of people as a business evolves, at least I have. And, um, and so each advisory board member, th right now I'm in a phase of um, weighing a potential partnership with a strategic investor or um, a couple of their major business development deals, and there's one advisory board member of mine who's a classmate and a venture capitalist who's sort of been to this rodeo ten times. So I'm on the phone with her every three days for half an hour for this month. Um, then the, I might not talk to her for six months. So, you know, I think that the advisory board members, in my mind, are there to cheer and be friends and be sounding boards, and each one has, in my, from what we've chosen, whether they were wine experts like Pete Mondavi Jr. or whether they were um, Greg Waldorf of eHarmony, uh, the CEO, or whether it's people, someone who founded Opinions.com. I've tried to pick people with different expertise who had different skill sets to lend. Some fundraising, some marketing, some biz dev, some financing, some, you know, all that stuff. So that, that's how I've focused my attention in bringing together a board of advisors and to how to compensate them. The board of directors is equity, um, and the board of advisors is smiles. Sweat equity. Sweat uh, No, 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 literally no like they. Yeah. We call it sweat equity. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're just sweating and you got nothing to show for it. They get wine dividends and they, uh, they, they get wine dividends and they get invited to Napa once a year for uh, two days of whining and dining where we make them sit in a room for one of those days and think through five major problems. So it's like three board meetings in one. Um, but I, I honestly don't know how I would have done it without them, whether sort of charting. Well, so how did you in the early stages? recruit these people to board and be on your board of advisors? So, different ways. So, the classmates who are venture capitalists is an easy one. The uh, a close friend. The professors out of the GSB who had been instrumental in helping shape pieces of the product offering while here were also sort of easy ones. The harder ones were people where you, one person gave me advice of, if you could have anyone in the world, who would it be? Anyone. I mean, literally. Who do you want to do this? And the answer is if you figure out who that person is and you ask them, once in a while you might get lucky and they say yes, which in some in one case of mine they did. And in another case, even I've heard from someone else, even if that person can't do it, they might have ideas of people who've worked for them or worked with them that can do it. So uh, I think it's just about good old fashioned networking. But really, how, it was really more, we started, it was more a pie chart of what kinds of skill sets do we want to have on this advisory board and then thinking about the network and who would fit it. And it's a pretty organic process, I think, if, as you're researching a business plan, or at least as I was, and in, in, in talking to people about it, people who show keen interest and key care and check back in and see how you're doing are starting to for, informally serve as advisors, and then sort of like a dress rehearsal, and then you ask them, and if they're willing to do it, then it becomes more so formal. So that question to be on your board of advisors is something, a crescendo, a crescendo of a conversation as opposed to... That's that's very eloquent way of putting it. It is, and it's not... It's not I didn't just meet someone on the street who I thought was great and then, you know, scare him into, you know, shock him with a question. It was a relationship, a close relationship, a friend, a, a professor, a uh, another mentor that I'd had lunch or drinks or dinner with multiple times, and then it was almost like, you're already advising me, how could I not ask you to do this formally? And if for whatever reason they couldn't or shouldn't do it formally, that was already, that had already been discussed. Just keeping on the, the Board of Advisors topic for now, we can move on to the Board of Directors. How have you seen entrepreneurs or, or CEOs use you effectively as an advisor? <clears throat> well, I've, I've been I'm currently on two um, small company Board of Advisors and have been over the course of the last 15 years or so. And I've seen them, I, I think it's a, a wonderful strategy, as Alyssa mentioned, to determine what it is you need. And those needs change over time. 
So initially it might be someone who could help you put together a really terrific business plan. Um, maybe it's someone who knows about the market you're targeting or has some product knowledge. Over time it can be fun become fundraising, et cetera, et cetera. And then and ev eventually going up to being, you know, maybe having some expertise in formalizing a corporate structure, you know, bringing on a board of directors for, from the outside, et cetera. So my, my role generally has been, um, my, I have a kind of a broad background, but generally it's been um, around uh, business planning. Um, I've had friends who've asked me to come on board, and I've done it mainly because I'm friends with them and I'm interested in their product, but primarily it's been the relationship. Um, and then other times I'm, I'm an expert in their, in the target market. And it becomes, it's sort of, maybe it's a friend of a friend of a friend or something, right? And I'll meet with them and talk with them a few times and just decide that's something I want to do and I have the time for. So I think that, uh, but really defining your needs and understanding that they change over time, I think is one of the most critical elements of choosing good advisors. I would add to that also mm -hmm. quickly, that intuition, in my case at least, was really important. So listening to really your response to people or as you're thinking through, you know, your business issues and challenges, you meet random people. And there is just this aha moment that occurs to me, I'm like, oh, I got to get this person. And I never think very formally. Just approach them, I say, I would really like an hour of your time, whatever you can spare, can I just tell you what my problem is? And as soon as they get engaged, that chemistry just takes the life of its own. So I would urge you to be very intuitive in who you pull in, especially in the earlier stages. Um, you know what you need. Uh, you know it better than maybe putting it on paper. So. Now, how many people do you have on your board of advisors? I've lost count. Yeah. Um, I have uh, probably 15 by now. But as the business evolved, um, our needs changed. You don't ask them to go. Right. You don't need, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So unless there's a real huge bad issue. And in yeah. one case... That um, for the board of advisors, but not so for the board of advisors. Right, I mean, you, right. you've got one, you really let's don't be, ask yeah. them to go. Yeah, <laughs> Well, in one case, um, a technology advisor that we had actually looked like maybe working for a competitive company. And in that case, you know, I had a very frank conversation with him. I brought you on because of these reasons. Pick your horse, basically. And he picked us. So we had, you know, nothing to fear from that perspective. And one of the articles that yeah. was assigned for reading spoke to having term limits, you know, term basically a term assignment for advisors and directors um, saying that you know that the highest value actually comes when they just initially come on the board at some point they kind of get distracted and lose interest and that certainly holds for a board of advisors board of directors have in theory some kind of fiduciary responsibility or frequently investors and by definition those usually have terms based on your corporation documents right. but have you, have you guys had terms with your board of advisor roles yeah. yeah, I've had terms with the Board of Advisor roles that I've had. Um, some of them, you're termed out just because the business didn't go anywhere. Right. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. But other ones, that, <laughs> other ones get yeah. termed out because, you're right, the, the business change changes. And I think it's very good governance practice for yourself to have those term limits, even for advisors. Mm -hmm. Because you never know when somebody's really dysfunctional. And it's really, unless you're willing to have that honest conversation, mm -hmm. which sometimes people have a very tired, hard time having, and you know that about your own personality, mm -hmm. term limits really help you um, cut through that um, mm -hmm. reluctance. What do you, what do you think about? is the right term? Because I didn't do it and wish I had. Two to three years. Yeah, two to three years, I would say. And, and I would say the term limits are, just to make sure everyone, we're all on the same page on this, is that generally you would ha define a term as a couple few years. Three is really common. Yeah. Three years, because it takes you a while to get up to speed and understand what the business is. And then generally you would say you, you serve for two, three, four terms, mm -hmm. and then you're out regardless. But the nice part of that mechanism is that every three, three years, years the conversation comes up. Right. And you either elect someone again or you don't. See, the, and that's what's really nice. It provides you an opening to have the conversation. You're meaning this for the board of advisors or board yes. of directors? Board well, of advisors. you see it much more commonly with board of directors, directors, but it can also be put in for a board of advisors. Because I was going to comment that in my business, things move so fast that mm -hmm. three years is an eternity. Mm -hmm. You know, two you companies. Can shorter. You can make yeah, it shorter. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, some people, so I would advise technology people yeah. out there to do it shorter. Yeah, you, you could do two, uh, two years, mm -hmm. three two-year terms. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So if you really want some, you know, to have that conversation every two years, mm -hmm. you could. But it gives you that opening. Yeah. A year sure is pretty short. Yeah. Yeah. Unless you're using them like a staff person where they're right. almost that's, there every day. That's exactly yeah. right. And sometimes you advisors, that's how I was used for one, is I was almost there every day like an employee. An unpaid employee. Unpaid yeah. employee. Yeah. Um, which, you know, it's it can work for the skill that you need. But. Thank God for people like you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Ask me if I'll do it again. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You mean the advisor in this house I brought dinner to three nights ago? Yeah. Right. Right. Okay, Evelyn, you might have another job before you leave. Yeah. Um, and getting to the compensation question, um, do you do any compensation for your board of advisors, or it's the, it's the trip to Napa or the dinner three nights in a row? Um, I, I have honestly not, and I've been very upfront about that. And the reason is, is that it is, the, I think it's sort of karmic, right? You know, it, people who want to see you succeed, the investment, the payoff, not always, is knowing that the time and energy they're spending investing in you and in your business is going to help it move forward. And if you show gratitude in ways, material or non, and actually show it and you know express it i have ex you know i think that that is sort of at least in the way i've experienced it has been payment enough um if there were to be a, a real win at the end would i send the people who've been the most helpful some ridiculous wine to say thank you which is you know a payment uh, yes i mean they've gone the people who've gone above and beyond know they have and there's nothing i would want more than to be able to compensate them and for policy reasons it wouldn't be so clean to give some equity and some up not but if at all, they know that the gratitude I feel and that I'll find a way to take care of them at some point in life. But directors, we didn't do even, um, for directors, we did uh, equity, of course, but we had that co that kind of awkward conversation about how much and, and so forth when we first brought on someone who was a paying customer, the, the, the paying, the, you know, the, the investor director versus not. And it's a, it's tricky. So I think if I could do it all over again, I would have had even clearer kind of policies around, as clear as they were for the board of advisors not paying anything, I would have been even more clear about what the compensation structure was going to be for the directors earlier. So it doesn't become an individual conversation That's right. in yes. each case, a hiring decision kind of. Correct. Yeah. In our case, all of our advisors are uh, compensated with stock and it's uniformly done. And some of them I have compensated twice because of the amount of time they've spent yes. really like on unpaid employees. And in technology, it's about a tenth of a percent is typical. And it usually comes, of course, in form of stock that vests over four years. So. Now, in terms of board of directors, for the two of you, because you have not taken outside investors, Correct. right? Now, and listen. I can address when you need one. Yeah. And technically, when you have employees, you have more than three employees, you have to have at least two board members. Okay. That's how my husband came to be, but then that, that rule kind of goes away. When we have serious money and investors, probably we will, you know, get more serious. But for now, we have other fish to fry. It, I find it a terribly useful thing to do as an early stage company. I, I'm I'm a big proponent of board meetings. Mm -hmm. It is literally like going to the dentist every three months. It is an un. It is it is like you know it reminds you to floss every day. I mean it is a. I'm serious. I think it's a crude metaphor, but it's actually, it's one of those things where stopping the music when things do move so fast mm -hmm. uh, for early stage companies to stop the music, just stop and just look at your dashboards of what you were trying to achieve and what you did and what you didn't. And you did all this in left field, but the core things might have gotten left behind, you know, at least in our cases, a couple quarters. And then you get back to it or you decide that the dashboard needs to shift. That, that process of coming back and doing something that's sort of painful and takes a lot of time and pretty stressful and all of this, but doing it, I, I have always also been grateful that we did it right away. And a couple of our my classmates who are entrepreneurs I know have done it but did it later. And they, when they were calling me for board books and saying, you know, oh my God, how have you done this? I think you get a little bit, particularly if you're a first time entrepreneur, I think the board is pretty gracious about giving you time to get your sea legs and figure it out, particularly the first couple quarters. Whereas if you've been operating this thing for two years, whether or not you'd ever done chaired a corporate board before, there's sort of an expectation, I think, that by that point you would have figured it out, at least how to run it. Um, so I found it useful to use that that first year of being a founder and CEO of a tech startup to have a board of directors. It was a great, I mean, it's just a phenomenal learning experience. And it's a phenomenal discipline that, of course, public companies have to go through. 
but private companies don't always have to, and I, I've been very grateful that we have. I think the idea of flossing is a really good one. <laughs> but you don't have to have a board of directors to floss. That's true. Couldn't, that okay. is true. <laughs> so, so, so we are, we are um, I have, out of my investors, I have three that are particularly close to the business, and they are brutal in their assessment of the business. They are my flossing, cleaning. <laughs> I can go on with the metaphor even further, but we're being filled. <laughs> so, I, I'm serious. When they sit Your down... And yeah, it's my root canal, absolutely. And they, they stop the music and say, it's great, you're, you know, a million miles a minute, whatever, but what you said you were going to do, you haven't done. And so it doesn't have to be with a formal board of director. Um, I have been um, a co-founder and um, um, an executive member of multiple uh, startups that had very formal board meetings. And I have to say that it could go the other way, too, where the preparation for the board and the politics of it are just, just not worth spending time on. And I kind of came into this company um, with a little bit of that baggage, if you will, that, hey, I don't want to have a board meeting that takes a week to prepare for. If flossing is needed, i got to be adult enough to do my own flossing, root canal, etc. And I chose these three people because... Well, they chose me. They gave me their money, um, but but they they actually allowed me to be uh, kind of a a first time CEO. I don't know. Should I do this? Should I do that? I don't have this answer. So they were gentle with me, but then it started coming down, and that was very helpful. So, um, Evelyn Elizabeth, can you talk to kind of some good practices you've seen in early stage entrepreneurs and how they engage, particularly their board of directors? Um, one of the things that I found to be most useful is, uh, and I've talked a lot with entrepreneurs I've worked with, is that no surprises policy. Um, and I, I personally have a philosophy that it's never too early for bad news. Um, and so so I don't like to be surprised, particularly if it's bad. And so if it's on, on any subject, really, whether it's you know revenue or development or fundraising or whatever it is, I'd rather know earlier in the game so that I could potentially help or at least get my mind around it, um, you know, to, to somehow help to steer the company back on the right track. So that's one thing that I, it's a kind of a mindset that I bring in. Um, and also, I, I guess the other observation is that I, I appreciate Alyssa's comments about, you know, taking a break every now and then, every three months or whatever, to, to just take stock of where you are. I think that's useful. I don't know that it, you, know, you absolutely have to stop everything for a week to prepare or any of that. Mm -hmm. And ideally, you'd be collecting yeah. reports and documents that mm -hmm. in general... And, 70, we, and we've gotten better. Yeah, 75% yeah, are kind of there, are and there. then you have some additional stuff that you have to prepare for the board of directors or the board of advisors. But I do think that um, it's extremely useful to just stop for a moment and evaluate. I would add to the no surprises. In fact, it almost doesn't matter what size board you have or what stage the uh, company is in. We've instituted in some of ours, I'm on the board of Aeropostale, which is team clothing based out of New York, mm. and they've got five billion in revenue. Mm. We instituted the 20 minute rule, which means if something bad happens, it hits the very top in 20 minutes. That means there's no filters, because the problem with filters is people try to massage it, mm -hmm. give it a little spin before it gets to you. <laughs> and as you as a CEO, depending on how many employees you have, you're going to want to know that right away. You don't want it festering in the organization because then you can't do anything about it until mm -hmm. it's too late. So that we... That bad news gets to the CEO in 20 minutes? Yeah. And, to, and then to the board right after that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how? Maybe... Yeah, Can you give us an example? Of, and what great. size of problem? Uh, like so, so this would be some, <laughs> the the problems that we have <coughs> we had we had at Aerosol. It's public knowledge was we had a um, embezzlement. Mm. So, if you have very trusted employees and you have an employee who uh, is stealing from you and somebody else finds out, you should know about it. Your board of advisors should know about it. That's the no surprises because it can hit the fan waves very quickly and the way things happen between Twitter and YouTube. It's surprising how much hits, and Yelp, it's surprising how much hits the airwaves. So it gets to the CEO and corresponding with them to the board as well? Yeah. Does the CEO then have 20 minutes to get it to the board? <laughs> or less than that. <laughs> less than that. I mean, especially if it's an advisory, mm -hmm. yeah. advisory role. 
you have to have some that you really trust in the advisory role that you can call right away and say, we've got a problem. Give me your thoughts on it. Um, there was some conversation in the article that we read about the right number to be, particularly on the board of directors, I think the board of the advisors, I mean, they're really not an upper limit. Um, what's your, been, been your experience and what is the right number of folks on the board of directors? For us, it's been eight to nine, eight to nine um, board members, partly because anything larger than that, it's tough to get a decision made. So you really want eight to nine board members it also allows you to separate into committees if you're going to do committee work. Typical committees are audit committees. Most of them have a governance and nominating committee and a compensation committee. Those are the top three. And then depending on the kind of industry you're in, if you're technology, sometimes you'll have a committee just focused on the technology. Um, so eight to nine works really well. You can get decisions made without having to um, try to corral 15 people. 15 is just too much. depending on the size of the company? No, even I was on the board of Long's Drugs, which was another $5 billion company, and we had eight people. I would say that um, I, uh, the boards on which I currently serve are, are generally nine, but seven to nine for a public company, and then that can go up into the billions of, in revenue. But also for smaller companies, um, I'd say five to seven, mm -hmm. maybe. But, um, and that's counting the CEO. Right. So you'd have right. four to six. And generally people have an odd number because then you don't have a, you don't need a tiebreaker vote on, on difficult subjects. So you have an odd number of directors generally. Yeah, I, I, I have five, I have five. And it's great, it's a great number. Um, in fact, you know, it, we've been more recently saying if someone came in, a new strategic came in, we wouldn't want it necessarily to be even for the aforementioned reasons. So. My business partner and I are both on the board right now, so she, you know, potentially she would step off, or we'd, we'd figure something out. Because and do you keep it local, meaning no travel, no, um, no um, board members from outside? So no, actually, okay. uh, we have. So two of the directors are here. My business partner's in New York. My team is here, and I'm of course here. Uh, and then the director who, so my business partner travels here, but also the the director who joined us a year plus ago, who wrote the big check. Uh, is in Chicago and he travels um, and he travels so we do it in Napa at Jack's winery and have a great lunch after the prize um, but uh, but yeah we do it they do travel and I have done one board meeting as a call and there is no substitute for getting five people in a room and looking them in the eye and having a conversation I mean I really 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 didn't do not like having people call in it just changes the whole dynamic well, and that's why they keep it small, from five to eight, even mm -hmm. for large companies, yep. because you get a better chance of getting everybody's calendar, totally. finding the same date to get them there for the face-to-face. -face. Phone calls are so hard. But but for the advisory board, I would I only get them all together once a year, and getting and then that relationship is managed much more one-on-one, -on -one, one -on -one. where it's a one-on-one -on -one call. I mean, I know some companies who basically have in their bylaws that as a member of the board of directors, you need to be present for board meetings. Yes. I mean, I, I if make people sense. measure that they report it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it, it, the expectation is that you'll make the in-person meetings. I do think that with committee meetings, sometimes or with short subjects, I do think that that um, particularly if it's something that's been discussed before, you can have an effective phone call meeting. You know, I, I, that can work. But but it's it. You're right that nothing is a substitute for in-person. Yeah, and for for quick triaging the bad news stuff that you share within 20 minutes um, that you know is something that needs, it's an action item, that it has a conversation. I have definitely had board calls that have been 30 minutes that we get people on the phone, but for a four hour, we're gonna swat through major things. That's, that I have found. I would definitely, next time, put it in the bylaws, as Linda suggested. That's, I mean, I haven't had a huge problem, but it, it, you know, it's a challenge. You should be doing them in the bylaws before it becomes a problem. That's right. Um, for outside board of directors, what's the proper compensation um, with a privately held early stage company? Well, um, I'll comment. Uh, my experience has been ranging from near zero mm -hmm. um, with equity only mm -hmm. to, um, you know, with, with no real, um, no solid, of course, perceived value of the equity eventually, you don't, you, you hope, right? To, I was involved in a, um, a smaller company wasn't right at startup when I joined, but shortly thereafter, early stage, uh, they then grew to be a couple hundred million dollars over the six year I was on it. 
And it was privately held through that whole time, and then they, they then sold it. And it was $5,000 a year in cash and some equity. And what, what amount of equity? I'm thinking maybe it was 10,000 shares a year or something. And but what percentage did it come in? Oh, it wasn't hardly even. Yeah. Half a percent, quarter it, it percent? It was low. We do, qu we do quarter point per director per annum. For outside yeah. directors. We, for they, outside directors. Yeah, right. we didn't actually measure it, and I don't remember because it was a few, we sold it a few years ago. Another so. okay. data point is Cheryl uh, Sandberg just took a, a board role at Starbucks, two hundred eighty thousand dollars annual compensation. That's a public. That's a public. Company. Company. Well, that's a large but public. Yeah, right. So you can range. Yeah. That's there's a big range. There's yeah. a big range. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good job. Very good job. If you can get it. Very good range from yeah. five thousand to two eighty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, one more question, then I'm going to open it up. This class obviously is all women, with a, the topic of the class being entrepreneurship from the perspective of women. Are there issues specific to women as they recruit their boards of advisors and boards of directors that they should consider? Is it go for it? It doesn't matter what you get on the board, as long as it's got the skill you need. Well, so I'll speak to my experience before juniors, before the company that I'm running right now. I think if you're a woman and if you're not, um, and if you're one of the executives and you're not uh, one of the founders, board of director makes a huge difference in the way they perceive you, how much you're in in the conversation. Of course, the CEO matters a lot and how close you are to the CEO and stuff like that. So that's one extreme kind of where being a woman, I think, you really have to watch what the board's perspective is of you because ultimately every month you're in front of them, you should evaluate them as potential bosses. Do I get along with them? Do they understand me, et cetera? Um, in a smaller company, it matters less, and it's really about how much of a go-getter you are to go get the board of advisors or board of directors who you can convince. It's a sales process, if you will. Um, and, and the first person I approached is a very famous person, my very first board of advisor person. It's a very famous person. I was all nervous. She's actually a graduate of the GSB. I was like, and so she finally reached across, kind of put her hand over my hand, and said, you want me to be an advisor? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yes. She said, it's OK. It's a tenth of a percent of the equity. Is that okay? I said yes. And she's a contemporary. She's not an older person, or you know. I think but she was here last week. Was she? I think well, so. Did she say the same story? No, no. Oh, no. <laughs> we timed it that way. Oh, I mean, there's been some discussion. I mean, yeah. so I've heard some folks say, as a woman, um, if you're going to have one woman on your board of directors, you need two, so somebody's not singled out as the woman board of directors. Um, I mean, I just throw that out and see if you have any so particular I response that, to it. <laughs> I see that being on a board. That So I'm on a board with it's all men, and we're opening up uh, another board seat because one's retiring. And I'm insisting it's another woman on the board because I do find, as a woman on a board, it's helpful to have another woman on the board. Of course. As a woman. I wouldn't necessarily say if I was a woman CEO looking for a board member that I would necessarily pick out a woman, um, though. You know, I think they're great, so it's just, it's a skill that I'd be looking for. But as a woman on a board, I'm going for another woman. Mm -hmm. Well, just to follow up, just to expand on that, and Evelyn can chime in. I'm, I'm on three public boards, and I'm the only woman. And I've been the only woman on these boards. And um, there's something about, well, on one of the boards last week, okay, so this is a contemporary story. I walked in, and the head of the governance committee, okay, so this is the committee that's supposed to be, you know, setting the rules of how you, you know, things behave and all that stuff. He said, oh, Liz, I could hard to, hardly wait to see what shoes you wore and if they matched your jacket this time. And I, I kind of paused for a second, and I just thought, okay, all right, what do I say, what do I say? And I said, you know, me too. I just love that little number you had on last time. <laughs> and he was like, this is in front of the, uh, the guys, the other guys. So he's, but, but you know, it's, um, 
it's really nice if you get a little bit more of a balance a balance in energy. And with one woman, you're the only woman. And and you're uh, you know I feel I have a I feel like I have a lot to contribute and I'm respected in most situations. However, I I'm the woman. I mean very clearly. And I, I also find that women. Um, we tend to use our intuitive skills really well in the room, and we sense what's happening in the room, right? And the guys just don't get it. <laughs> so if you have another That's woman true. in the room and you sense there's something wrong, if you look at another woman in the room and she senses the same thing, you guys have this flashing <laughs> signal between the eyes that you know. And so both of you can bring up the issue and you won't feel so isolated by yeah. bringing the it's issue It's the isolation. Up. It's the isolation that you get, even though they try to try to be good. But, yeah. you know, I, I'm a lot older than I really look because of my Asian skin. So people <laughs> always ask me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just the color of the hair. You know? so, um, but, but sometimes the men will treat you as a niece or um, you know, a favorite daughter rather than the contributing member that you are. So again, it always helps to have another woman in the room because you reinforce each other and you reinforce your contribution. That's super That's interesting. I mean, from an entrepreneur's perspective, being obviously a woman who founded a company whose business partner is also a woman, I, I literally was just looking at skill set. I swear it didn't even occur to me. Maybe it's generational. I don't know. I was looking for skill set. These guys were there. The age difference is they could be my father's. There's complete respect. Maybe that's, you know, they want to help for that reason. It all works in my current situation to my advantage. Um, I have no problem whatsoever having an all-male board except for us. Honestly, none at all. Um, I can see, though, I do have another woman in the room, and it is my business partner. So, I, I mean, that I cannot ima imagine not having, and that... I could definitely see being strange on a board. Well, I think, Alyssa, too, because you're the founder, you're the vision, you're the genesis yes, of the idea. Right. They no, have a different relationship right. with right. you. Yes, you're right. Because of that. So you just said that you might bring out another board member and your partner might step down. So yeah, I think, the prob woman in the room. I think the probability is, oh, I have a great relationship with these guys. I've known them for three years. It, it would be different if I were walking into a cold. Um, yeah, that doesn't, that doesn't freak me out either. I think what, but it, but it makes me mindful of if I, for the next one, if there is no business partner or a male business partner or whatever the case may be, of making sure there's a woman on the board. So the other thing um, I would counsel you to be mindful of is, I don't know at what stage of business you're in now, but as you see it ramp up and grow, there will be a point where somebody will think, can she really run it? Mm -hmm. And at that point, you really want supporters, depending on what your goals are. Maybe you want to pass it on and say, you know, I love starting, but I don't like running huge. But just be careful, because I have so many friends that have started companies, and venture people coming in would tell her, oh, we invest mm -hmm. if you are out. Or they, will, they won't say that. They would invest, and then six months down the road, make attempts at, you know, yeah. nicely or not so nicely removed and I think that's where being a woman comes in as, a, as an entrepreneur is, you know when things get really good when you're sitting there and saying wow you know good job yes. um, you have to think about whether you you know what is your relationship with your board and whether you trust them to back you um, I don't know if guys have that problem I, I haven't had the chance to ask people wonder if it is worse for women I don't know any questions, Tanya? I'm still having a little bit of trouble understanding a board of advisors. I get what they're doing for you, but I'm having trouble with kind of the balance between the formality and the informality. It feels like actually it can go both ways sometimes. Like I'm hearing sometimes it's actually sort of like a mentor relationship that's a little bit formalized. And I'm curious what the benefit of actually formalizing it and saying like, can you be my mentor or can you be on my board of advisors? Credibility. Credibility, because otherwise it's a piece of paper and an idea and something you're out there floating in the wind trying to start. But all of a sudden you've got this circle of people with, at least in my case, far more life experience and credibility than I had, and whose association with me and this venture all of a sudden shored up the validation of going for it. That's why you do it. Right. All of a sudden, if three all-stars in technology and the wine world are spending their time and lending their name and being publicly on a website that's searchable by Google, wait a second, it's not just 
some GSB alum with an idea, you know, out of Silicon Valley, it's now has legs. So that that's to me the reason to do it. I would completely second that. And, um, and, and how you use that, you have to be very careful because um, depending on who your advisor is, and that goes also for funding partners in my case, uh, some of them are very careful with their reputations. So you want to be very careful about how you use it. Of course, you don't want to be like a little kid always running, saying, may I, may I do this, may I do this? But you want to be very careful, and um, they are your credibility when it's nothing but a set of PowerPoint slides. And I should have been more clear. Half of our my advisory board members, well, not half, a, th a third to a half are investors. So these are people who believed in me and gave money, and they didn't write enough. We're not going to have a 10-person or 15-person board of directors for all the aforementioned reasons. So this was a way for me to acknowledge their support without walking around saying, hey, this guy's an investor in my company. And it's also a way for them to it also helps in that it's, it, it, makes, it takes it from a totally passive angel investment to a somewhat active investment just by the virtue of the fact that it's, you're sort of publicly outed. Not all my investors are on my advisory board. They, don't, they, don't, they shouldn't all be. And um, the ones that had value to add that was directly relevant are. But that's the other piece of the story that a lot of angel-backed companies do because you're not going to put everyone on your big board, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Right. You guys also mentioned the value of the mentorship piece, um, and I'm curious specifically for your board, Alyssa, um, for the ones that are like CEOs of these big name companies, you know, Netflix, eHarmony, do you find that they have the time um, to commit to the to the requirements of the advisory board at the same level as some of the other individuals? Um, so the way I treat the relationships is that it's not, it's very different from a board of directors where it's regular, there's monthly, there's, you know, in some cases bi-weekly or monthly email updates, there's quarterly meetings, it's, a, it's an ongoing, consistent, evenly consistent conversation, unless there's bad news which they hear about immediately because you have to and they're very helpful in helping you think through it. Um, in terms of an advisory board, I have much more of a go-fetch philosophy. It's like they're there, I need something and I go get them and then I'm in LA and I ask if there's any way they could squeeze me in for two hours for brunch and they do. Or I know you're slammed, you're trying to do five deals right now, your investments are going sideways, I need, two, I need 90 minutes of your time, anywhere, anytime, name them, you know, I'm, I'm there. So it's, it's a different type of relationship where it's, they're accommodating me, but it's, if they're signing up to help, to be drafted, at, at some moment they understand that that's going to happen, but as long as you're respectful of their time and work around it and the location, I haven't had problems getting it. What I've found, both as an advisor and also um, calling on boards of advisors or even boards of directors, is if you have someone who's very, very seasoned, who has deep expertise in something that's relevant, okay, which would be a good definition for a board of advisor, maybe throwing you a little bit of money. Um, it, it's a, I had a call about two weeks ago from a guy. I'm on his board of advisors. He has a startup company, and he said, and I'm I'm do a lot of work in executive compensation and equity ownership and that kind of thing on boards that I'm on. And we went out for drinks, kind of just as friends. And he said, so Liz, we're thinking we're selling the company and we're thinking and they want to keep on the management team. How much equity ownership in the new business should we have? Hmm. And I said, oh, I don't know, somewhere between 18 and 23 percent. He said, okay, good. Done. You know, done. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Boom, yeah. boom. You know. Yeah. So, so it was kind of, you know, like that. So that was my value add in that moment. And, um, and so, you know, that's what he's going to go negotiate. He, it saves him a ton of time. So if you have those people, if they're CEO of eHarmony or whatever, you know, they, um, they can a answer a very, very particular question and save you, like, weeks and months of work. Even boards of advisors will do that for you. So I'm involved with one where we want to sell a piece of the company, and um, they've already met with a potential buyer who I happen to know. So the CEO called me up and said, okay, what can you tell me about this group? Why, why are they interested in buying? What's their stick? And um, how should I approach it? And so mm -hmm. that's the kind of advice that you would offer. So you guys would go offer more credibility, more experience than somebody who, you know, maybe they're a retired, um, you know, individual that has, you know, infinite time in the world to <laughs> work with you. I, yeah, <laughs> I would, I would yeah. strongly urge you to go for... Um, name, credibility, but someone who's actively in the business. 
in some way or form or shape. You don't want somebody who does this as a hobby because they may enjoy certain aspects of you know meeting up with you, learning about new things, and so forth. You don't have time for that. <laughs> right? You want somebody who will you know tell you 18 to 23 percent now go yeah. and I only have 15 minutes for you. Yeah. yeah. Of course, she's retired, so you know, <laughs> it's okay <laughs> to get somebody who's retired. Yeah, it is. Me, it is. <laughs> yeah, but you know there is a there is a range. There is a range. After yes. a there is a range. point, you know, they're more interested in you evolving as a human being and so forth. So I, I draw a very clear line between being having a mentor. Um, and having these boards of advisors. I'm a lot more formal with my board of advisors. I have a particular ask. They are there because, yes, it was intuitive, but it was intuitive towards the product. It was intuitive towards needing to know how I can do a better presentation or you know, financing issues or whatnot. Um, but, but you are asking them for particular expertise and you are not there to you know, open yourself up and say, I'm feeling really vulnerable right now, or I have a slight <laughs> problem with my partner. Um, this, this, this none of that. Yeah. Yeah. None, none of that. That's not what you use yeah. it for. Exactly. And, and, and then who do you ask? So what there were a couple of people that I came this? across in the fundraising journey over time who's loved the idea, got really passionate about it. I thought I was going in there to have a fundraising conversation, and maybe was, and it became very obvious it didn't take you know, that much intuition realized either the financial circumstances had changed in their personal life or it, w it wasn't yeah. the space for them to write a check, but they were really, really, really getting it. And, and those were people also at times that I ended up asking to advise who have been great. Other questions? What are you finding that someone on your, your board, is it particularly directors, is it really helpful? Um, how do you deal with that? I I'm sorry, I didn't hear the first part of the question. When someone on your board isn't particularly helpful. Oh. Um, I guess you guys address the term limits a little bit, but when there aren't term limits. Board of directors or board of advisors? Directors. Okay. <coughs> you said with advisors, you just kind of Less and less time. <laughs> less and less That's right. Yeah. It works itself out. Well, in the, yeah, for the board of directors, if, if they're, um, there's, okay. is it, there's, there's uh, gradations, I guess, in that. If they're actually obstructionist and uh, having destructive conversations or, or something not at all supportive and, and a block, yeah. then you might need to take action and actually remove them. Um, I was running a company where we, we took out like to use that phrase, we took out um, uh, of the original nine members of the board, eight, not counting me, only one still remained at the end wow. of two years. Wow. All wow. gone. Wow. For various reasons, I won't tell the sordid stories, but, um, but I just had really um, hard but direct conversations. They had all said when I came in, look, we, you know, we serve at your behest and you know, a bunch of stuff. But they, it was um, early, you know, they weren't up for re-election. Sometimes you can do that. With the board of directors, you do actually have a re-election every few years or every, every year sometimes. Now. Every ahead. year, yeah. So you can remove them every year. And ideally, that's what you'd, you'd have a conversation and say, um, our needs have changed. Thank you so much for your service. It's been terrific. Um, Please don't run again. Uh, <laughs> no, just to say, um, I think we're going to have a different slate this year. It's time to make a change. Any of those phrases will work. Um, <laughs> Are you referring to this as a CEO? You did this or as it's another a CEO. board member? It's a CEO. Okay. And sometimes if you've got a good uh, lead director on your board, mm -hmm. the lead director can have that conversation with the individuals. Yeah, so we can push good. back on that. Push out? Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. I had one board member who refused to retire and uh, wanted to change the term limits and the retirement age. Retirement age was 72. Well, he always fell asleep at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So, um, nap, time. <laughs> nap time. So anytime he forgot that we had agreed to do something, I said, oh, it was 3 o'clock. He kind of fell asleep. But um, <laughs> you know, he, had some, uh, he, he wanted to extend the term limits of 72 as retirement age, and he wanted to extend it beyond that. He'd already been grandfathered in once before. So he wanted to extend it again, and uh, the board didn't want to come up against him because he was one of the old timers in there. So I had to be the one who was presiding over the board to tell him, this is good governance practice. We're sticking to this. We've made it public that this is the retirement age. 
So you would be doing a disservice to the organization by staying on. Mm. Yeah, there are a lot yeah, of tough, tough conversations. Call. Tough call. Mm. Yes. Okay, I'd like to hear more about that. You know, we talked about managing conflict and tensions with um, your partner or founder in the previous panel. I'd like to hear more about managing conflict um, in through your board, especially. I mean, I'm making a generalization here, but I think women tend to be more collaborative and consensus building. And I know that's something that's been difficult with my board is when there is disagreement. You know, I know ultimately we can call the board vote, but it still feels weird when, you know, you'd rather, you know, you come to a certain decision because everyone agrees rather than calling a board vote. Because if you call the board vote, it also does destroy some of the dynamic that you have on your board. So I'd love to hear more about that and how you manage conflict. Um, and if you, you know, think they're trying to build consensus, it's just not even the right way to go. Tell your story first. Or I'll tell my story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people, people on boards are human beings, right? So everything you see in life, you see in the boardroom, almost everything, right? And so you see all kinds of really interesting behavior, characters, and all kinds of stuff. There's going to be stuff that comes up. Um, so I would, I do think it's it's almost always better to take the high road and try to work through to an agreed decision and then take a vote, you know, not win ugly all right. the time, because that takes a lot of energy and it also leaves a lot of scars, right. okay? So um, you can always do that, but it's, um, you know, you should save that after right. trying some other things. Um, I, I was on a, a board that I was, a, a new board that I was appointed to last year in mid-year, and it was my first board meeting, and I was appointed the head of the comp compensation committee. It's one of the things that I, I focus on on boards. And uh, much to my surprise, although I'd just been recruited, the, in the executive session following the open board meeting, the board only, minus the CEO and the members of management, we had a meeting, and it came out that the rest of the board had been thinking about and actually had decided to replace the CEO. They hadn't told me this in the interviewing process. <laughs> so so I, I kind of, you know, I said, well, what led to this? I got a little bit of the story. And then it turns out that the chairman of the board was leaving for Europe the next day. And the head of the governance committee was leaving for Hawaii on Saturday. This was Thursday. And so neither of them could tell the CEO that he had to go. And so kind of like Speaker of the House, you know, and the president and the whoever else is gone, they said, Liz, you're next in line. Could you please tell the CEO on Monday That's that why he's they fired? You in, right? Yeah. Send her in. That's right? Awful. She'll do it. So I said, you know, I fired a lot of people. I can do that. You know, I... Okay, so I did it. And then I had to negotiate him out with the contracts and the attorneys and to negotiate the new CEO in. So my first two weeks on the board were spent doing all this scut work, basically. Um, there are ways to do it as gracefully as one can, given the circumstances. That, that was a pretty significant issue. And then I had to come, circle back and talk to the board about why they left me with that and that, you know, how that happened. What they say? They said we didn't want to do it. Except for me, yeah. That's brutal. So I started the story a little bit earlier about the guy that didn't want to leave, and the rest of the board did not want to confront him. Mm -hmm. And because for exactly what you said, they didn't want to um, stir up the dynamics inside the organization and have bad feelings, even though the guy was leaving, right? But they didn't want to have bad feelings against each other, and because they also thought two of the members of the seven-member board would vote for him to extend the term, and then the others wouldn't. So like um, Liz, I had to be the one going in there, but I approached it from a governance point of view. Yeah. So I said, okay, we set rules a while ago about when our retirement age was going to be. We've already grandfathered you in once before, and it's public knowledge. We wouldn't look good from a PR point of view. The heightened governance, the heightened SEC inquiries into are you following your governance practices, yada, yada, yada. So that's the, the tack I took. Um, at the end of the day, he wanted a payment because at this point in time, it was a mutual fund company. Mutual funds don't pay stock. So um, he wanted a payment. So we agreed for a one-year consulting fee. So he would get paid half the stipend, and it was $200,000 at the time. So half of that, a $100,000 consulting fee. And, and he left. And he left, and it was fine. Lots of times it comes down to money. Yeah, it does. You know, it's a lot easier if you can pay somebody to leave. 
it's sad to say, but yes. Yeah. Can I have one more question, Lisa? Um, so I'm curious about the time expectations when you join a board. When you're asking someone, are you thinking in your mind, like, this person's going to work for me, you know, on, on my behalf several hours a week, or are they just going to show up at the meeting? You know, how, well, what's the expectation of both, I would say, the advisory board? And obviously we've talked about how that's more informal, but I'm just curious about what the expectation is in terms of how much sort of effort. I, I don't know if it's super informal like they're a friend just they call you know an advisory board just calls you to check in on how you're doing I mean once in a while if you've had a very they coach you on something and then you know they want to know how it went because they're thoughtful people they'll call back but and see how it went but realistically in my experience with either or it's you drive the level of engagement as the CEO so you say I mean there's an expectation on a board that you will come totally prepared to a board meeting and thoroughly read a board book and I've gotten hammered for only giving people a couple days to read it. They have busy lives, you got to get these things out a week in advance. Um, and obviously if you're an advisor and you need, an, I need an hour of your time, I have to, as I've already mentioned, work around your schedule. But I think the time commitment probably varies by the nature of the company and the problem and the role and capacity you serve and obviously um, this ladies can speak more to that on a consistent basis over time. But I think it, it varies by also what the company is going through. So if, if it's if you've just been funded and things are cruising and they know you've got a year of runway and they know that it's about execution, you might give status reports and then wait till the next board meeting. If you're negotiating potential, you know, strategic deals, running out of cash, needing to get rid of someone, in a dispute with some of your contractors, these are these are things that necessitate frequent conversations. So I think as long as in my experience, you're upfront about what your needs are and you communicate them, it, it, the, the, the timing, it, it shakes out naturally. For formal boards of directors, paid positions is really a job. And there are, you know, requirements against which you hire people and, and it's always, you always outline in a lot of detail what the time requirements are. So there's five, six, four, five, six, seven meetings a year. They're generally two days. You tell them the location. You tell them actually for a year ahead of time when you're recruiting what those dates are. Wow. So if they can meet it, right? And and then the expectation is they would be fully prepared. And if there's committee service, and you talk about that, and it's, you know, it's it's it, it's not like full time work where you basically expect someone to be full time, you know, all the time. So but so you have to lay it out very explicitly. Um, and I even think that for advisory board members, I think it's great to set an expectation. You know, I'll call you from time to time on issues, or I like to get people together once a year in Napa, you know, whatever it is, because everybody, you know, has other stuff. We have a very um, formal, specific document for the Board of Advisors, and it says, for this amount of stock, you are committing, mm -hmm. and I believe it's two hours per month, plus an additional twice a year, uh, half-day meeting. But there's, you know, it's specified like that. Now. Do we hold them to the two hours? Not really. Sometimes, depending on what we're going through, it may be you know a full day or it may be just 15-minute calls, but back to back, multiple days. Um, basically, you pull them in, you drive what you need to get out of them, and that hasn't been a huge issue. But um, our attorney suggested that we specify here's the stock package and here's what I'm asking you to do. So in case of a dispute, there is something to fall back on. And board members recognize that if you're going through an acquisition, which we've both done, you could be on call almost every day as right. you're going through Absolutely. the transition. So it could take, you know, I've been on four or five hour calls every week for that. Super. Well, thank you ladies for coming at this late hour. Thank you.